Please stand. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and also believe in me. We brought nothing into this world and we take nothing out. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Good morning. I welcome you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to this homegoing service for an extremely special lady, one of the most beautiful persons that I have met in my life. My name is Anthony Bain, and I am pastor of, I'm Sister Taylor's pastor. I'll say it that way. And from the time I met Sister Taylor, she embraced me. And later on in our relationship, she adopted me. So I am an adopted child. And I loved her like she was my mother. And it really grieves me this morning to be here. But I am happy, and we should all be happy, in the thought that she's gone to be with the Lord. She was devoted to her Lord, to her Savior, to her family, and to her church. She always used to say to me, I am not going to anybody else's church and make them look good at my church down here. I come in to my church. And she stuck with that. Reverend Taylor can tell you there are many times he goes to do conferences or minister the word um, at another church. Sister Taylor would drive down to Martinsville. He has to get to the other church. Sister Taylor coming to Martinsville. Wonderful, wonderful lady. On behalf of our church family, I'm sure that I speak on behalf of the general superintendent and our district superintendent and all the other pastoral staff. Um, we offer our uh, sincere condolences to you and your family, my dear father at this very difficult time. I want to acknowledge the presence of our General Superintendent, Reverend Cumberbatch, our District Superintendent, Reverend Hines, and all of the other uh, ministers in the Wesleyan Holiness Barbados District, as well as any other ministers from other churches who are here. I want to thank you very much for your support I also want to acknowledge the presence of all of you who are here to support the family at this very difficult time. Let us pray. God of life, as we have learned to do in all of our experiences, we come to you this day in this hour of death. Father, we know that you love us and that you can turn even the shadow of death into the light of morning. 
Help us now, O oh Lord, to wait upon you with reverence and with submissive hearts. Bless all those who mourn, Lord. I especially lift up Reverend Taylor and his siblings before you in a very special way. Minister to them now. Let the power of your Holy Spirit just descend upon them and strengthen them. Hallelujah. Lord, we bless your holy name. Lord, this homegoing service, we turn it over to you. Let your perfect will be done here this morning. May you be pleased. May Sister Taylor be pleased at everything that is said and done here this morning. These things we pray in no other name but the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'll turn over to the worship leader who will come and bless us with the hymn. We'll sing Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. I trust that he is yours. And we can sing this song with confidence. Though sad at the passing of our sister, we know she is with the Lord.
every Sunday that I minister the word. I didn't know Sister Taylor as well as I know her now. She was the first one to meet me as soon as I came off the podium by the steps. Good word, Pastor. So after she did that about five times, I said, I, the fifth time I rushed into the bathroom and I finished. I didn't want to go in the bathroom, but I wanted to see what was happening. I locked the door and I stayed in there for a little while, five or ten minutes. When I unlocked the door and I came, she was there standing up. <laughs> By the bathroom door. Good word, Pastor. You thought that you missed me now. Good word. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful lady. We'll begin the tributes now and we'll start with, sorry, we'll have the first Bible reading and we'll start with, uh, by Elon Gibson. The reading of God is going to come from the book of Proverbs, chapter 31, verses 10 to 31. And like I said, it will be read by Elon Gibson. And as soon as he's finished reading the word, you may take your seats and he will start the tributes with his tribute. Praise God. I said, praise God. Amen. Amen. Maybe during a going home service, but we know that she just changed her address. Right? Got a new home. No more pain. No more suffering. No more departing. So we know that she just changed that address. All right? Our scripture reading this morning is taken from um, Proverbs chapter 10, and I'm reading the NIV version. A wife of a noble character who can find. She's worth far more than, mo than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings to him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and wax and works with her eager hands. She's like the merchant ship, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it's still night. She provided food for her family and portion for her female servant. She consider a field and buy it out of the earnings she plants in the vineyard. She set about her work viciously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. In her hands, she holds the distaff and grasps the spingle with her fingers. She opens the arms of the poor, to the poor and extend her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes covering for her bed. She is clothed in fine linens and purple. Her husband is respected among the elders at the gate. She makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed in strength and dignity. She can laugh all the day long as they come. When she speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction, it's always on her tongue. She washes over the affairs. She washes over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women can do noble things, but you surpass them all, Sister Taylor, Auntie Taylor, Mommy Taylor. You surpass them all. Charm is destructive and beauty is fleeing, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise. I know I met our sister Taylor, you may be seated, back in the early 80s. I'm married to her, her niece. And the first time I met her, it was as like if she knew me. And that relationship carried through until the last day of her life. I've never seen Sister Taylor, Gloria, upset. On nothing. I've never seen her like that. And I always would remember her, how she accepted me into the family, and that I can say I was very happy. 
I'm very happy to be married to her, her, her niece, and I know that we're going to miss her daily, but we know, like I said, she is transitioned, and we just changed her new address. And one day, you and I, too, have to make that transition, but make sure that your address is changed in that heavenly realm where we will see her again. God Here's bless you. Thank you, Brother Gibson. I am not a lover of fish cakes, but um, any of you who knew Sister Taylor knew that she made the best fish cake that can ever be made. Her fish cakes were punctuated with a lot of salt fish. Serious. I used to eat hers, and I used to eat them by the dozens. And she didn't used to she didn't used to make them big and all ball some little neat little bite sized things. And she knew that her son, the pastor now, well, had gotten to love her fish cakes. And whenever she prepared fish cakes for the church, mine would come special. No. My father, Orville Taylor, whom I refer to affectionately as young man, he has challenged me, because I don't eat cuckoo either. I have, I have, since, I have not eaten cuckoo since I was a boy less than 10 years old. I just don't like it. Never eaten it in my adult life. But my father, it was yesterday or the day before, my friend, and we were talking on the phone. He challenged me. You know, he, like, he was saying, you like my wife's fish cakes? you got to come and eat my cuckoo. <laughs> so as soon as the burial is over and we settle, I prepare cuckoo and pork hocks for you. <laughs> so I can't tell you what I tell him. But I tell him to make sure that one of the rooms downstairs with a little bowl in it, um, neatly made up for me because if anything happened, I can need to visit there. Um, so we have a date. Right? <laughs> the tributes continue now. And um, I, first of all, I want to apologize for the absence of our acting district superintendent, Reg Reg Reverend Virgil Paris. He called to say that he's not well and he didn't sound well on the phone. And he's sent an emissary, Reverend David Garner. So I know I invite David Garner, Reverend, to come and give a tribute on behalf of the Barbados District. Um, as soon as Reverend Garner is finished, I will ask Joyce Slow to come from the Lodge Road Wesleyan Holiness Church. And following Joyce Slow, I will ask Janice King from the Haggett Hall Wesleyan, where Sister Taylor was a member for a long time before she came to Martin's Bay, and the other churches that she worshiped up with her husband. Reverend Garner. Thank you, Reverend Ben. Good morning to all. It's a pleasure this morning. I know it's a strange word to use, but I know here that we are here for a celebration for the life of Gloria Taylor. And certainly as I stand this morning to represent the Barbados District, I would certainly want to take a couple of seconds to reflect on the life of one of the most glorious women. There are a few I know, my wife included, <laughs> and my mother, that I have ever met. I would have met Sister Taylor back in the late, late, late 70s, 80s, and uh, as a member of, well, not a member then, as a young Sunday school child of the then church, Village Wesleyan, with a lot of young men, and we've all grown. But if, as you see us now, we were not then. And I could call some names that you would probably be familiar with. But the point that I noted about Sister Taylor is that despite the fact that I was back then quite scruffy and rough and all of that, somehow this woman always interacted with me like if I was the most precious being on God's earth. 
I mean, the, wherever I saw her, whenever I saw her, the glow on her face said to me, Oh, I am so glad to see you. And Reverend Taylor would attest that whenever we meet, even to this day, no matter what her agenda is, it is never too busy to stop and inquire and share a word of encouragement. And so today, I have to say that this is a woman whose life was spent investing in others. And we are ever so thankful to have met her and to have been a part of her life. And certainly, she was a part of our lives. I want to bring greetings from Reverend Virgil Paris, our acting district superintendent. And I'm sharing on his behalf this morning. Gloria Taylor was a faithful member of the Wesleyan Holiness Church, whose ministry started at the Haggett Hall Wesleyan. Sister Gloria was a suited helpmeet. She served with her husband, Reverend Orville Taylor, in the pastoral ministry. She assisted in ministry as an organist, and that was one I didn't know, choir director, and several other ministries. She was a wife. I'm not sure we didn't put a great one in there. A mother, the receptionist for their home business, and a seamstress. It is said that she outfitted many brides. During her time of ministry in the 70s, Sister Gloria worked at the district office as secretary to Reverend Irvin Wickham, district superintendent. She supported her husband when they pastored the St. Philip's Circuit. These churches included, and when I say included, simultaneously, all together, all at once. Ragged Point, Church Village now Shekinah, Thickets, and Six Roads now Rima. They also served at the Maxwell Wesleyan. At the Lodge Road Wesleyan, Sister Gloria remained in active ministry for 25 years. There she helped in the music ministry, as well as helped as Sunday school superintendent and assistant Wesleyan women's director. The life of Sister Gloria is reflected in John 9, 4. While it is still day, we must do the works of the one who sent me. Night is coming, then no one can work. Sister Taylor and her husband, Reverend Taylor, continued their pastoral ministry at the Martins Bay Wesleyan Holiness Church until their, re their retirement on December 31st, 2012. I think he spelled it wrong. He had T-A-R-E. But we know they, had, they never retired. <laughs> Nonetheless, they remained at the Martins Bay Wesleyan Church, and Sister Taylor remained in active ministry and served as Martins Bay delegate to the annual district conference for several years. Her pleasant demeanor and her infectious smile I'm going to say glorious smile, will always be remembered. Isaiah 57, verse 1 and 2 says, The righteous perish, and no man takes it to heart. Merciful men are taken away, while no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil. He shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds each one walking in his uprightness. I believe that Sister Taylor will never be forgotten. I believe we all take her parting to heart. And certainly, we are here as a district in support of our dear brother and her family as you will continue to reflect on her memories, on the memories you have of her, and certainly continue to celebrate the life of Gloria Lolita Taylor. May God bless you and may she rest in peace and certainly rise in glory. I grew up hearing the old adage that God always takes the best for his garden. 
But to be honest, we are in no hurry to get there. Pastor Taylor and his family came to Lord Road in March of 1980 and spent 24 years plus there. It did not take long for the members to embrace them spiritually and physically. The women especially loved Sister Taylor. There was always a kind of warmth emanating from her and an infectious smile and a soft, comforting word that sometimes you wonder if she ever got vexed. I always admire her deportment. Not only did she adorn herself, but occasionally you will see Pastor Taylor looking dapper in his goldish color shirt and tie to match. And Sister Taylor would step in with the same color dress to complement his attire. It was so funny that one Sunday morning, one of the older members mentioned to me that she believed that that match was made in heaven because they were inseparable. To be honest, they were like Bud and Lou and sung and sang like Dolly Parton and Kenny Rogers. <laughs> Most Sunday mornings, Sister Taylor sat in the pew before me. And one Sunday morning, the pastor took his message from John 8, 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. She glanced back at me and said, I hope you ain't telling her untruths. <laughs> but we understood each other. So there were no hard feelings. Once I was at their home in Maxwell Heights, and Highland, the youngest boy, started to give a little trouble. And I said in my mind, you know, I would give him a little flick. But Sister Taylor exhibited that motherly, tender, tender love and some calming words, and he was back to normal. Gloria was a real help meet to Pastor Taylor. She was Sunday school superintendent for five years, and I assisted her for a period of time. She made sure that those children were fed both spiritually and physically. The Sunday school teachers were also recognized for their helpfulness, and we treated to little pocket-sized gifts, or even a little party at their home, and this was always deeply appreciated. Her hand was always in the pie, and she assisted Pastor Taylor in every way possible. On one occasion, the church was celebrating a special event. Our regular choir master was overseas, and the pastor got the members together and held three practice sessions. On the final Thursday night, we started to sing. Sister Taylor dropped out of her seat I went to the old organ and made those keys talk. I started to pop because we never knew that she was musically inclined. That Sunday morning, I will never forget Pastor Taylor directing, Sister Taylor on the organ, and the choir singing. I care not today what tomorrow may bring of sunshine or shadow or rain. The Lord I know ruleth for everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith in Jesus, and I'm trusting completely. I've never seen this dear lady vex, although I had a little running with her. She was my seamstress for many years.
And here you can see her handiwork. Once, I took some material to her, and she looked at me and asked, the teachers don't ask you if you don't know any other color besides peach. <laughs> well, don't bring back any more peach material. Then she smiled broadly. What are your bid? Sister Taylor not only lived by the Ten Commandments that were handed down, but to me she had some other commandments. Love people, don't use them. Develop an understanding with people. Compliment and not criticize. Always have a sense of humor. Practice what you preach. Always taste your words before you spit them out. Sister Taylor, wife of Pastor Taylor, a mother, the first lady, a Sunday school teacher, a Sunday school superintendent, a board member, a soloist, a preacher, a choir director, an organist, a seamstress, a dresser, and most of all, a Christian lady. What a lady. She will surely be missed. Good morning to the brethren. Say the name Sister Gloria Taylor and you draw a blank stare if you are speaking to a long-standing member of the Pilgrim Holiness Church, now the Wesleyan at Haggett Hall. Say the name Sister Reed and the light comes on because that's how she was known to us. Whether you knew her as Sister Reed or as Sister Gloria Taylor, you knew a lady who stood tall above many. Her kindness, her generosity, her commitment to task and excellence were simply admirable. From the moment you met her, her ever-ready smile expressed a warmth that said, I'm so glad to see you. Sister Gloria grew up in the then Pilgrim Holiness Church at Haggett Hall and became a very active member in her youth, getting involved in just about every aspect of ministry. Musically, she sang in duets and quartets, regularly singing one of her favorite songs, Crown Him, Lord of All. She was organist at General Assembly, and she directed the choir. Many of the anthems and, uh, and psalms she taught are still remembered and loved today. Educationally, she taught in Sunday school and had overall responsibility for this important arm of the church as Sunday school superintendent, a role she executed well, even taking on the added responsibility of journeying often to the Pine area to conduct branch Sunday school there. At the time of Harvest Thanksgiving services and other special occasions, Sister Gloria personally coached children of our assembly through song and verse to ensure their best presentations. It is not exaggeration to say that children had Sister Taylor's heart. She undertook a special ministry in children, called Children's Services on Friday evenings, during which children were introduced to a variety of activities and topics on moral guidance, among others. Facilitators locally and internationally were also invited to share in sessions, which were much like today's Vacation Bible School. Sister Gloria is indeed remembered fondly by many in our assembly whose lives she touched in these respects. 
One such person, Brother Tony Mapp, credits her with him giving his life to Christ after he met her for the first time at one such children's service and experiencing her kindness extended to the children, something to which he was unaccustomed and which won her a friend for life, especially when they were invited back to her home after the Friday sessions for refreshments. Like the woman referenced in Proverbs 31, Sister Gloria believed in being industrious and improved her skills in many areas, which not only brought income, but benefited the body of Christ and the community with its far-reaching effects. Classes in music, cake and pastry making, dress making, and secretarial studies were undertaken by her. Subsequently, she splendidly outfitted many satisfied female members of our church and community, and indeed sent off many bridal parties. Her secretarial skills were utilized at district level when she became district secretary. As it is with life, which is a series of meetings and partings, it came leaving time. She moved on, and it saddened us at Haggett Hall to lose her, but we're happy in knowing that she was moving on to yet another aspect of her calling, that of wife and mother. A value cannot be put to the priceless contribution she made in our vineyard, but we know she has been and will be richly rewarded. Many children have already called her blessed. We, the pastor and members of the Hackett Hall Wesleyan Holiness Church, extend our deepest and sincerest condolences to you, her family, as we weep with you. We pray for you to be strengthened as you walk through this valley. God continue to bless and enable in Jesus' name. I was a policeman for a long time. Almost 30 years of my life I spent in the Royal Barbados Police Force. 30 glorious years. If I had my life to live over again, I would be a policeman all over. And I say that to say this, as a policeman, I saw death in many different forms, violent, uh, shooting, st I had to deal with a lot of death. In Sister Taylor's last few days on this earth, my wife and I, we got to spend a lot of quality time with Sister Taylor and Reverend Taylor. I remember the second last time we went there before she passed. I just went to the bed and hugged her and I kissed her and I kissed her about 40 times, telling her that I love her and she's going to be well and, and as weak as she was she was trying to tell me she loves me in return on her damn bed she died peacefully that's the way I want to go with a lovely smile on her face just laying in her bed and Reverend Taylor had her all dressed up she died as she lived gloriously And I now invite the worship team to come and we'll sing that hymn, Life's Railways to Heaven. And after that. This song is the most apt analogy of life. I trust that we take it to heart. May we stand.
the second Bible reading is taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, reading verses 13. Sorry. to 18. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Least you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who fall asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then Then we who are alive. And remain shall be caught up together with them in the clothes. To meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Amen. Amen. You may take your seats. Um, I'm going to take liberties here. Reverend Ben, um, just to give you a little inside information. I, Daddy had asked the boys to help prepare the service, and in the second reading, I had second reading and tribute, but I took it off. I didn't know if I would be going to be able to make it to do a tribute to my mom. But I, I said, whatever, I'll just do it. Um, And you're probably going to get the supplements before you get the full meal, because my brother Paul is doing the eulogy, so I'm just giving a supplement <laughs> before the meal. Um, and I want to start out and say, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11 says, When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I want to preface this tribute with that, to say... Y'all have heard all the glowing things from those mostly on the outside, talking about Gloria, Lolita Taylor. We know her as a mummy. And not that she didn't discipline us, <laughs> because as Elon read, she epitomified, epitomified the help meet that was described in Proverbs 31. I believe, you know, in, in, in God creating for Adam Eve, Mummy fell off as a copy of that, you know, a help me. And one of the things that mummy would often help daddy with is discipline his children. And it was so much so that the more egregious offenses were left to daddy. So you knew that when daddy's mummy said, wait till your father gets home, you know it was serious business. And daddy had not had to ask any questions. He was not looking for any court of appeal from his kids. He already knew the judge judged fairly, and he was just dispensating the punishment when he got home. You know, and, and, and you've hardly ever got beaten from, from discipline from daddy, corporal punishment, but you know it's something serious when mommy tell you thing. And again, when I was a child, I understood as a child, I didn't see it that way, but that became a bad. I put away a child estate, and I'm thankful for mommy, both for the discipline and leaving to daddy <laughs> to discipline when he, when he had to. 
And, I, you know, and one of the things, you know, that mommy would be a help me for daddy for was providing for us as a family. And I recall one day we were living in Gaw Hill, Christ Church then. And you know, mommy is a cookist. Reverend Ben can attest to that. But mommy was also a person who likes to experiment from time to time. And I remember this day, mommy decided to experiment with us boys with cow heel stew and rice. No, I can tell you, mommy knew from the time she put that on the table and we had the first aid. Now I'm not here to attest of the goodness of Kauhi, so y'all can have that debate after the service. All I can say is that all three of us, we would have been around the age of 98, around 98, all three of us, we doth protest too much, mommy gathered, and she sat at that table and made sure that plate was clean. <laughs> All three of us. No, she was right to do that, because in my heart, I was saying to myself, if she ever moved from there, <laughs> the dog Max would have seen my plate that evening. Mommy knew that. And I saw that as, I was like, my worst fear, though, was not, eating, not only eating that, Cold heels too. What was that? Are you gonna have to endure this again another time? <laughs> but that was my childish thinking. Only to learn later on, as a man, that mommy did not want daddy to come home and find three hungry children just because they don't want to eat what was put before them. You know, mommy had a saying, let the strength go through your mouth. <laughs> and so that was her. To me, that was her helping daddy that he wouldn't have to come and worry about, you know, heading to Chevelle. You know, nowadays you head to Chefet, Burger King, or something, you know, because you know, like what's in front of you. Mm, mommy wasn't about that. She knew her fa my father, her husband was out working hard. Y'all eat this here. And what, as a man, I grew up and realized, you know, after that, we never saw a cow heel again. I'm <laughs> serious. So it shows me that mommy. Though she was strict in making sure we ate what was before us, she listened and recognized that, look, this ain't going over. And I only learned later that daddy liked cow heel. <laughs> but mommy, I don't ever recall mommy ever doing it again, at least not for us. So she, she, she listened. And that's what I understood now as a man. And I remember one other time, and you, you would have heard how mommy is a one of her professions as a seamstress. And I remember, and this was, I think we were living in Maxwell at the time. She had, um, this is, she was an experienced seamstress by now. But someone gave her a challenge that, you know, I, I, mommy was baffled how to make a seamless skirt. No zipper or anything. Mommy had never done one up to that point. I didn't remember mommy talking to me about it, you know, and it baffled her. I didn't remember a few weeks or days later, mommy called me to the dining table where she would normally do her seamstress work and said, Roger, I figured out, let me show you. And I saw the excitement on mommy's face as she drew out the pattern, folded it a certain way, made a measurement and did the cut in a curve and just laid out before me a seamless skirt. I saw how mommy learned something new you know, and she, she was so enthused to share it with me. You know, as a child, it, 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 it was like, I've never seen mommy, you know, so enthralled about getting to learn something, even at that age and even with that experience. I knew it wasn't that because she shared it with me because she wanted me to become a seamstress. <laughs> you know, well, after all, it was already a tailor. So, so, no. but, but, but for me, 
it was the fact that she learned something I was willing to, I want, just wanted to share it with someone. And that's how I am. I realize that's how I am. I like to learn things, not to keep them for myself, to figure out what I'm doing for whatever I'm fixing or, 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 or trying to, you know, to, to make right. But I learned, I like to pass on that knowledge to teach other people. And that was Mummy's heart. But one of the most indelible memories of me was, I probably was about the age of seven or eight, I can't remember. And at the time, we were at Maxwell Wesleyan Holiness Church then. And I believe it was a week of crusades. And I know that he was, as host pastor, was on the stage. I know the church was full. I believe it was a Thursday night. I can't swear. I was fairly young then. And after the message, the call was given as we stood to come to know Christ. I do not remember the message. I don't even remember who the preacher was. You know, all I know is I remembered this call, I wanted to go. And I remember mommy bending down next to me and saying, Roger, do you want to go up? I had no conversations with mommy. I didn't look her in the face. I was just staring straight at the altar. And I believe that the prompting of the Holy Spirit, mommy said, Roger, do you want to go up? And I remember that night. Mommy walked up there with me. And I gave my heart to the Lord. I didn't remember going home that night. Seven or eight, I didn't know nothing about bills and taking care of family, nothing so, but I felt like a weight was lifted off my shoulder. I knew that only had to be God. I remember that feeling as it was yesterday. And that was at mommy's prompting. I believe she followed the Holy Spirit to ask me that question. And I will never forget it. So I say that to say that mommy, even in her, her love for what she did, in becoming a help me, she did not lose herself. She only brought what she was and what she, all that she was to this family. So being a help me doesn't mean you lose yourself, you lose who you are. It simply means adding to who others are in helping. And I want to say, as First Corinthians goes on to say, it says, for we know in part, First Corinthians 11, it says, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but then when that which is in part is done away, we, we shall know, and no mummy knows. For that which is in part has done away, and that which is whole is now known by her. And my encouragement as I close is that those of us who know Christ, faint not, nor be weary in our well-doing, for we too shall reap the reward. And those who don't know him, you know, don't wait to you get on the other side to find out that you knew the truth or you could have known the truth while you were here. And like mommy did for me, I would bend and whisper, do you want to know him? Because all that you have heard is not a facade about mommy, that was mommy. Who was true to her God, true to her family true to her faith. And if you want to know him, you also can know him before it is too late. God bless you. Good morning to the church and this song keep on believing was specially requested by pastor Taylor because this would have been the last song he and sister Gloria ministered together at their church so my brother he can be close because we are of the same household don't think it's anything strange and we are going to minister this song keep on believing. You know, when it was 50, I had to hold things there to see well. Now I'm over 60, 
I have to hold it here. <laughs> Keep on believing. A song of faith, even in this time.
Isaiah 43 verse 2 says, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you because God cares about everything you are going through. God sees you. God is with you. This song too was a special request. It says, does Jesus care? Does Jesus care when my heart is pain too deeply for mirth or song? As the burdens press and the keys distress and the way grows weary and long. Oh yes, he cares, I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the day Does Jesus care when my way is dark with a name less dread and fear as the daylight fades into deep night shades? Does he enough to be near. Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the day Does Jesus care when I've tried and failed to resist some temptation strong? When for my deep grief there is no tears flow all the night long. Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me and my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks? 
to him does he see Taylor, also known as Mummy, was born on May 13, 1938, to Maud Reed. She was the last of three children. She was educated at South District Primary School. After leaving school, she furthered her education by doing courses in sewing, shorthand, and secretarial work. She was born and raised in Haggett Hall, St. Michael, and as with most Barbadians born in this era, church was a central part of her upbringing. She worshiped at Haggett Hall Wesley Holiness Church as a Sunday school girl and eventually became a member. Mommy was not satisfied with just serving her local church and with her secretarial skills, served the district office of the Wesley Holiness Church for 14 years as its secretary. She not only interfaced with many pastors in the district, but would prepare reports for local and district boards of administration conferences. Now, this may not seem like much, but imagine doing this work in the era where there were no computers or printers. Reports were typed up using a typewriter, and copies were made with a machine that, made, that had to be cranked manually. Hyla and I have memories of watching Mummy crank out the paper from this machine. I remember the sound, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And Hyla said he remembered the rhythm, cut, 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 cut. As we can see, we can understand why he remembers the rhythm. <laughs> Even as a young adult, her willingness to serve others, her humility, her humility and industrious nature, nature was evident. Earlier, I mentioned that Mummy interacted with pastors as part of her duties as secretary in the district office. So it's not surprising that she married a minister of religion. However, it was no fairy tale romance, but a story of God's mercy and grace. Having lost his first wife tragically, my father, Reverend Orville Taylor, was a widower with two rambunctious toddlers and a baby boy to raise. Gloria Lolita Taylor caught the eyes of the young grieving minister and after a brief courtship, were married on August 6, 1977. I remember, I remember mommy remarking to me that she never wanted to, to marry a pastor. 
but clearly God had other ideas. Genesis 2.18, this is the New American Standard Bible, says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. As a Christian, mommy was not only a hearer of the word, but a doer. This was evident in the way she took care of us, her boys, and her husband, a full-time minister and a business owner. She not only assisted my dad by providing secretarial duties for the business, she was, a, she was also the chief financial officer of the household, or nurse, or counselor, or chef, or sh extraordinaire, and much more. My brother Roger, as an adult, once asked mommy when she had worked so hard to ensure that daddy's needs were catered for when he got home on evenings. Mommy explained that daddy was a full-time minister and also running a business, so it was her duty to ensure that he did not have to worry about home life as well. Even though mommy gave up her role as in the district office to, to, care, to, care, to take care of her family, she continued to sew, making clothes for many people for many occasions, and a lot of you have heard of the many bridal parties that she did dresses for. I believe this was to help supplement the family income. I recall our family friend Arlene Ford would just bring material she liked and ask mommy to keep it until she was ready to have something made with it. Mommy ended up with stacks of material for Arlene, but always kept a chunk of all of it. Mommy made the first school uniform for Marlene Daniel, Nee Wickham, and never stopped sewing for Marlene until she retired from sewing. Even after retiring, Mommy would still do adjustments for Marlene. Mommy was an industrious woman, committed, and a woman of integrity. Mommy loved her family. We enjoyed when her mother, sister, brother, and niece, and family visited from overseas and stayed with us. She had an aunt who lived in Silver Sands, who she visited over, over to spend time, brought over to spend time with us. She frequently visited her family in Haggett Hall, St. Michael, and in her last, day, last year, she would attend every family member's funeral. On each occasion, I would receive a call from mommy informing me of, her, of their passing. When her sons married, she welcomed her daughters-in-law as though they were her own daughters. She was a constant source of help and encouragement wherever needed. She played a role in my own wedding, designing and sewing the dresses of our bridesmaids. Mommy lavished her care and affection not only on her immediate and extended families, but those with whom she came into contact through ministry. Just this week, I learned of the many lives Mommy touched in her involvement with Haggett Hall as a Honest Church. As a Sunday school teacher, Sunday school superintendent, choir director, and leader of the children's ministry. As a seamstress, she also made many outfits for weddings for many of the children with whom she would have interacted as a youth leader at Haggett Hall Wesleyan. Tony Ma, a longtime friend of Mummy's, related to Daddy and me at the viewing, that she had written him a letter of encouragement after he had migrated from Barbados. Even, through, even though this was over 50 years ago, he still had the letter. I also remember by reminded by one of my neighbors from Maxwell, Joanne, of her birthday calls to Raphael, Joanne's son, whose birthday was two days after Mummy's. And every year since Raphael was a teenager, he would call her on her birthday. And two days later, Mummy would call him on his, without fail, every single year. I heard of many stories of how my mother had impacted the lives of various persons over the years with the thoughtful gestures such as these. Mummy loved children. My first experience of this love was when she took care of our cousin, Corey. At one point, you may have thought that he was one of our brothers. But when Corey came along, we believed Mummy had gone soft, since things Corey got away with as a child <laughs> would have meant the belt for us. Case in point, Mummy was out with, with, with Mummy was out, and boys being boys, we were playing in the living room. One of us climbed on the coffee table and it broke. In a panic, we assembled the table to ensure it looked as good as new. Mommy arrived home with Corey sometime later. Corey leaned on the table and it fell apart. <laughs> Do you know what happened to Corey? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Years later, we saw this same soft, soft touch when her first grandson, Nathan, came on the scene. Mommy honed her child rearing skills long before she came into our lives. Having raised her niece, Denise, from a tender age of two and a half to 12 years. During this time, she developed a very strong bond with Denise, which lasted for years. 
Then he's kept in close and constant contact with Auntie, as she, Auntie Gloria, as she would call her. Even after the passing of my mother's mom, brother, and sister, all in the same month. In the years to follow, God blessed mommy with seven grandchildren. They were a source of pride and joy for her. She never failed to show her love in, in intangible or, in, or tangible ways. She was happy to play a babysitter when called upon to do so, and visits with her grandchildren brightened her days and theirs. I know that this will, that they will be, they will sorely miss their grand grand. When we were young, we always thought that our parents were invincible, a tower of strength, impenetrable to sickness and sorrow. However, in December 2000, mommy suffered a devastating loss. Her mother, brother, and sister, who lived in the US and Canada respectively, all died weeks apart. This loss hit mommy hard, but I got up close, but I got an up close look at her mental strength and resilience. I remember traveling a car to mama's internment on a cold winter morning and watching mommy closely. I could see the pain etched on her face, but she did not sink into despair or uncontrollable sobbing as such an occasion would merit, but instead carry herself with dignity, humility, and grace. Again in January 2006 at her sister's funeral, the grief and pain on, on the occasion was evident, but again, mommy met the situation with this inner strength that we have admired, that we have admired for as long as we can remember. In, 20, in 2018, mommy was hospitalized and had an operation. Even though she made a full recovery, the illness seemed to have slowed her down physically, but she remained bubbly and effervescent, effervescent as ever. However, sometimes in, sometime in February this year, her, her health took a turn for the worse, and on March 12, 20, 2022, she passed away at home. We wish to thank the doctors who attended to mommy during her brief illness. I say a special thanks to Dr. Sheena Weeks, to Yvette. We are indebted to you not only for your care and attention to mommy during her illness, but for always being a part of our lives and blessing our family. A heartfelt thanks to all family and friends who visited, called, text to offer words of encouragement or just be there for us in our time of grief. It was greatly appreciated. The foregoing was my attempt to convey the giant of a woman mommy was. I consider her to be a reflection of Proverbs 31. But her story doesn't end here. Because as a child, because as a child of the king, we expect to see her again when the king of kings returns to make everything new. Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, it gives me great pleasure to invite our Reverend James Ben now to deliver the word of God. I want to invite you to stand as you come and minister to us, Reverend James. Reverend ben. Thank you very much, Reverend Anthony, Reverend Ben. While we stand, we are going to read the passage from which I shall endeavor to address you this morning, going noon. It's taken from the book of John, St. John's Gospel, chapter 11, and I'm going to read from verse 17 to verse 27. St. John's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 17 to verse 27. Then Je when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she had heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. 
Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had said so, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come, and calleth for thee. Heavenly Father, this is your word, and we pray that as it is spoken, it would bless the hearts of all of us who hear. In Jesus' name we pray. You may sit. And before I speak, I would like on behalf of myself, my family, Anita, and my family, to Orville and his family, our deepest, sincerest condolences. To Paul, Roger, Highland, and your family, and all those who are in some way touched by Gloria, her family, we can only express our condolences and promise you our continued prayers, friendship, and support. There's a familiar passage of scripture which we have read. And I want to address you on the subject, the resurrection and the life, from this passage, the resurrection and the life. And the verse which we will center our thoughts on would be verse 25 when Jesus said unto Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever believe, liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And I want to suggest to you from the outset that Jesus made certain claims which I want to explore. We are met every day with people making claims, especially the advertisers. They make claims for their products. One product says, my detergent washes whiter than white and invite you, challenge you to prove that claim true by buying that detergent. I remember as a young man growing up many years ago, wanting a shirt, there was an advertiser who advertised this shirt and said, my brand shirt is a cut above the rest. Of course, when you hear that, that's vintage. The young ones would know that ad, um, but some of us would remember it. But advertisers make claims for their products, and then they challenge you to buy those products and see if those claims are true. Very often you see a hamburger advertised on TV and it looks so succulent and so sweet, and then when you go out and buy one, it's so dry. Um, <laughs> so you've got to watch out for claims. But it's all right, we should make claims. But I want to challenge us this evening that Jesus Christ made some claims and I want you as you listen and as you look, see if those claims have merit. It is commonly said that death and taxes are realities of existence. Some persons are skilled at avoiding and evading taxes. No one has yet told the story of success in evading or avoiding death. The Christian, however, claims that he knows the secret of victory over death. And he points to Jesus Christ as the source of that victory. And it is this Jesus who made certain claims about life and death. And those claims we want to examine at this time. So let's examine what Christ had to say about life, death, and the resurrection and the claims he made concerning them. So first of all, let's examine the claims of Christ. Now the story you know well is the story of the, the death at Bethany. Lazarus died and Jesus delayed his going to Bethany to meet with the family. And Martha met him as he came, as he, as he came to, to, the, to the place, to the house. And she accosted him with the words, if you had been here my brother had not died. Now, I experienced this not in its fullness in 2019 when my brother in Canada died. And my daughter and the family had called me at home and told me I should come as soon as possible. But somehow their, their message didn't seem to have the urgency that he was dying. 
he was just sick, and you're accustomed to sickness. And so I delayed my going because I had other things doing. But then when the final message came that it seemed as if he's on his way and he's calling for you and you should come, well, I dropped everything and got there, but when I got there, I wasn't able to speak to him because he was in a coma. But they did not accuse me and say, if you had been here, your brother had not died because that would make me feel real bad. But I was there for his death and helped to make arrangements for his funeral. But you can imagine how Jesus could have felt, or if you, how you would feel, if by your delaying your visit to a fem family friend or brother or sister, that you were accosted with the words, if you had been here, my brother had not died. That's what Jesus was met with. And in the face of that, Jesus made certain claims. And it's these claims I want to share with you at this time. The first claim Jesus made was that he is the resurrection. Martha said, I know that to Jesus' response that he will rise again, she believed as a good Pharisee in the resurrection of the dead. And she said, I know that he will rise in the resurrection. And it's this claim that this mo moment, at this point, that Jesus made his first claim, I am the resurrection. Now that would be astounding. I, he didn't say, I believe in the resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection. In fact, the, the resurrection inheres in me. I'm the originator of the resurrection. That's the first claim he made. I am the resurrection. He made other claims with regard to the resurrection, but we look at those as we go on. I am the resurrection. It is he who will bring life about after death. But if in order to say he was the resurrection, he had to say something else. He had to say, I am the life. So he made a claim, the first claim, I am the resurrection. That's his first claim. The second claim is, I am the life. And he extended on that by talking about eternal life. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's eternal life. So Jesus claimed, want to be the resurrection. It is he who will bring us back to life after we're dead. And it is he who will give us eternal life. So I am the resurrection and I am the life. He didn't say I am life because all of us know what life is. Life expresses itself in many different ways. Not I am life, but I am the life. In other words, all life has its origin in me. And all life has a sustenance in me. It is I who sustain life. And I will give you that life forever. These are stupendous claims that the human being, the human person, has to deal with. He also made some other claims. And I'll go to John 14, verse 6, where he said to the disciples, I am the way. Now we talk today and a lot of religious people and a lot of other semi-religious people like to talk about there are many ways to heaven and there are many ways to God. But Jesus Christ made a stupendous claim. I am the way, not I am a way. I am the way. And he not only said that I am the way, he said I am the truth. Again, he's not saying I am a truth. I want among many truths. I am the truth. In other words, all truth exists in me. When I was a young boy, I read a, an essay from the great English essayist, Francis Bacon. When he began it like this, what is truth? Asked Justin Pilate, but he didn't wait for an answer. What is truth? If he had waited for an answer, Jesus Christ would have said to him, I am the truth. He would have said, I am truth. He would have said, I am the truth. So Jesus made some big claims, some massive claims. I am the resurrection. I am the life. I am the way. I am the truth. And he qualified them all with the definite article. Not with the indefinite article, not with a, but with the. And he did it deliberately. These are the claims that Jesus made. But he made some further claims. He also claimed 
that faith in him ensures eternal life. He said that if you believe in me, though you are dead, yet shall you live. That's a claim. A big claim. A massive claim. A claim that you should consider. A claim that I must consider. If this is true, then it will change. It should change the quality and, and the philosophy of your life forever. He claims that he, faith in him ensures eternal life. But he also claimed, if that's a positive claim, then there's a negative one. He claimed that faith in him negates death. In other words, even though you died, yet you will live. And I'm glad for that claim. Those are, those are massive claims. Faith in Christ not only ensures eternal life, but faith in Christ negates death. And Paul speaks exultingly about death. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Because Paul believed Christ's claims and accepted them. Oh, grave, where is thy victory? We must today, you must today, consider the claims of Christ. The claim that he is the resurrection, the claim that he is the life, the claim that he is the way, the claims that he is the truth, you must consider those claims. The claim that if you believe in him, you will live forever, even though you die. The claim that faith in Christ negates death. All these are realities that we face as living human beings. And we must consider those claims. When he when finished the claim, when he finished making those claims, what did he do? He issued a challenge. So we not only have the claims of Christ, but we have the challenge. Now, when the advertisers make those claims, what do they challenge you to do? <laughs> Go and buy the product. And you know how many of us run out and buy the product? <laughs> to feel, to believe that it's true. And so many people fill up their homes with products based on advertisers. And I'm sure that we have some that we don't use. After one or two uses, we put them aside. But after a claim is made, a challenge is given. And what is the challenge? Verse 26 says, And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, full stop. Then a short, sharp challenge. Believest thou this? That's the challenge. So after the challenge, after the claims, I am the resurrection. I am the life. I am the truth. I am the way. If you believe in me, you shall never die. If you believe in me, you shall live forever. And even though you die, as we all must die, you will come to life again and live forever. These are the claims. Do you believe it? That's the challenge. That's the challenge that faces me, and that's the challenge that faces you as you sit in your seat here. That challenge faces us all. Do you believe it? What do you believe? What philosophy motivates your life? Consider the claims of Jesus Christ today and accept his challenge. The challenge to believe. I want to suggest to you that this challenge to believe is not a general abstract challenge. It was a direct challenge to Martha. He looked at Martha and said, do you believe it? In other words, it's a personal challenge. And today, it's a personal challenge for you too, as you sit here. Do you believe it? Doesn't matter what somebody else believes, because each of us has to answer for herself or himself. Do you believe it? Do you believe the claims of Jesus Christ? Do you believe it? Do you believe this? So it's a personal challenge. Do you, Martha? Do you, John? Do you, Mary? Do you, whatever your name is? And this is a woman here, but put yourself as a man in that place too. Do you, John? Do you, James? Do you, Philip? Do you believe it? So it's a personal challenge. I want to suggest to you too, it's a present challenge. And I'm taking this from the structure of the text. It's not, will you believe it tomorrow? Will you go home and consider and debate it and then come to a conclusion on it? 
The matter of salvation and eternal life is a present matter. In fact, I discovered this some years ago studying the Bible, that when the Bible speaks about salvation, it doesn't speak about it in the future tense. It's always in the present tense. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. So it's not that Jesus is issuing you this challenge, this personal challenge now, and say, go home, think about it, sleep on it, and then make a decision. I'm suggesting to you that the challenge to you right now, even as you sit in this place, is a personal and a present challenge. It's for response, no. Because today, if it's about salvation, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. It's a personal challenge to each one of us. And it's a present challenge. It's not next week, no, next year, as, 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 as the, the Agrippa said, some convenient time. You know why it's not some convenient time? Because none of us know when we're going to die. None of us knows. So now is the accepted time. And it's a challenge concerning his word. Do you believe this? Not anything. Do you believe? Th what is this? This is what I've just told you. This refers to the consequences. This refers to the claims I've made. Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection? Do you believe he's the life? Do you believe he's the way? Do you believe that the truth? This is what I'm challenging you to believe. Do you believe this? This is what I'm challenging you, Mary, to believe. This is what I'm challenging you, Mary, to believe now. In the presence of Lazarus' death. That's the challenge. And that's the challenge he's leaving with us today also. And finally, I want you to see Martha's commitment to Christ. What they call Martha's commitment to Christ. So we have the claims of Christ. I am the resurrection. I am the way. I am the life. I am the truth. The challenge, do you believe it? And watch Martha's response to that challenge. Immediate response. Martha said, I believe it. But notice she addressed him and said, Yeah, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which shall come into the world. So Martha responds to him, his challenge, by saying, Lord, I believe in you. I believe what you say is true. You are the Lord. You are the Lord. Not only Lord in the sense of master in the context of a social status and responsibility. I believe that not only are you, if you, if you think that you would misunderstand her and think that she was just responding to somebody who was her boss, she said, thou art, yes, Lord, but thou art the son of God. So she identified his person in his, uh, in his real role as Savior and Messiah and King. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Son of God. And I believe your statement is true. That's her response. That's her response to the challenge. Martha's response to a challenge. She expressed commitment to Christ first. Yes, Lord, thou art the Son of God. And she expressed commitments to Christ's person. Thou art the Christ. And she demonstrated confidence in Christ. She, she made a confession, and then the Bible tells us she left. And she, when she had said so, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly saying, The Master is come and call it for you. And I want to end on these, these words and this concept. You make your commitment to Christ. You accept him as Lord. And you go your way at peace, in peace. But you not only go your way, you go to your sister or to your brother or to your neighbor. And you can confidently say, the master has come and he calleth for you. 
In other words, my relationship with Jesus Christ isn't my own. And we've heard so many um, tributes, eulogies to Gloria. She did not live for herself or for her husband or her family alone. She lived for them, and that's good, but she lived for others. The master is come, and he calleth for you. We share our faith with others. The master is come, and he calleth for you. And I want to say this still morning. I want to say this morning before we wind up. The master has come and he calleth for you. And you are sitting there, you do not know Jesus, and he calleth for you. He makes some serious claims about life and death and the resurrection and truth. And he's asking you, he's challenging you to believe it. In the midst of all the voices that are speaking today, in the midst of all the philosophies, in, in the midst of everything that's going on, the Lord is challenging you to believe that he is the resurrection. He is the life. He is the truth. He is the way. Amen. And he's challenging you to believe it. No. Personally believe it and believe it presently. No. And I want you to be like Mary, Martha, to say, Lord, I believe. And then you can leave here with the knowledge that you are in the possession of eternal life. And you can go to your husband, your wife, your brother, your sister, your neighbor, your friend, and proclaim confidently like Martha, the master is come, and he calleth for you. Bless your word to our hearts, dear Heavenly Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God is here. Amen. Amen. I listened very attentively to Roger spoke, and he spoke very eloquently of his mother. And as part of his discourse, he made a very eloquent altar call. If, it, if this service was different, that would be a lovely altar call. I mean, I heard that. He said, go, Pastor Roger. Serious. And given what you said, and Reverend Ben confirmed it with the word, now, now is the time. And it is my earnest prayer that someone or someones here today give their hearts to the Lord as a result of hearing the tremendous testimonies about our sister Taylor. The Bible tells us that the angels in heaven rejoice when one soul. One. One. I prayed myself as Pastor Martin is when I can baptize one soul. I feel like a king. I've done something. Today, it might not be a formal occasion for you to do that. But if you know that the Lord is turning your hearts, I invite you to get into a good Bible-believing church. Come to Messiah's house. Come to Martin's Bay. And worship and give your hearts to God. Hallelujah. I now invite our Reverend Charles to come. And Reverend Charles will close us in prayer. My brothers and sisters, let us stand, please. Let us pray. Oh God, and our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time when we could come together as a people to remember Sister Taylor and her contributions, her calling to serve, her commitment to you, the church, and her family. We thank you for her consecration. We thank you for the legacy that she has left us. We thank you for her faith in God 
And we're glad that she gravitated to your claims. We're glad, Lord, that she accepted the challenge and her commitment was strong and secure. We pray now for the family, those who have been left behind to grieve and to mourn and to reflect and to consider the life that has just been taken from us. We pray thy blessings upon Reverend Taylor and his entire family. And we pray, Lord, that you will surround them with your grace and with the strength which comes from God. And may they find in you all that they will ever need. And so, God of grace and mercy, we pray that you will descend upon us again today. And that you will guide us as we proceed to the next part of the service at the graveside. And now we pray that thy blessing and thy benediction will rest upon us in Christ's name. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain and abide with us now and forever. Amen. So with our final song, I wish to take this opportunity to thank everyone who contributed to making this service a success that it was. I especially thank our brothers and sisters here at Messiah House for making this sanctuary available to us. Thank the personnel at Belmont Funeral Home for the wonderful job that they've done. All of you who sent Reese cards or offer words of encouragement, prayerful support, we thank you for your comfort and for your love shown at this time. I want to thank Reverend Ben for his stirring word. I'm sure that we all received it. And I pray that God will continue to bless and keep you all. Please remember the tailors in your prayers as you go about your daily business. Um, as we sing this last song, I'm going to ask that as we are singing the last verse, the Paul Bears and the Undertaker, please get into position so that we can have the processional. Thank you very much. This is the theme that holy angels cannot sing. Let us show them and praise our God to show them what it means to be redeemed. Yes. Redeemed oh, how I Jesus. love to proclaim it. Child and forever 
encouraging you all, please, to sing along. And can it be?
thing when we all get to heaven. When we all get to heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing out the be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout a victory. While we walk the pilgrim, song March into Zion.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we commend all people to your unfading love, that in them your will, your perfect will, may be fulfilled. And we rejoice at the faithful witness of your saints in every age, praying that they may share with them in your eternal kingdom and enjoy your love and mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now unto him that is able to keep you from failing, from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. And again, on behalf of the tailors and the other relatives, I want to thank you all for your tremendous support today, and we wish you Godspeed. Go in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance.